we're glad to be sharing the ministry of Redemption Church with you. Now join us as we receive the Word of God. Excellent. Thank you, everyone. Welcome, everybody, to Redemption Church. We're so glad to have you in our new space. Thank you for joining us in person. Aren't you glad to be here? I'm glad you're here. Absolutely. And everybody joining us online, we welcome you. We're so glad that you are here as well. God bless every single one of you. My name is Chris Fluitt. If you don't know, I'm so blessed to be the lead pastor here. And I've got a word to share with you today. Who's ready? We are in the fourth week, the fourth week of our series called Problem Solver. Can you say Problem Solver? Problem Solver. In week one, we told you that healing is a problem solver. Week two, we told you that rescue is a problem solver. And the last time we were together, we told you how to turn a tough year around. Because sometimes our years are filled with so many problems. There is a plan to turn all your problems around. I want to remind you that uh, the, the, the life that is successful is not a problem-free life, but a life that learns to solve their problems. All right? Look at somebody say, you can solve your problems. You can do it. You can do it. Even if you're married to them, you can solve your problems. I'm glad Sarah's downstairs. Today, I want to ask you, what is the solution for the problem of something's wrong and I don't know what to do? Something's wrong and I don't know what to do. Now, the something may be different for all of us, right? We all have different some things, right? But here's what's the same. Uh, The feeling of dread, (laughs) the feeling of inadequacy. When we have problems that we don't know how to solve, we don't know what to do. It's like, which direction do we go? Who do we call to solve such a problem? We're talking problems like health. Fall in that? Absolutely. There are problems like finances. What do we do to help our finances? How do, do I need to get a second job? Do I need to take out a second mortgage? What is it that I need to do? How do I fix this? What about relationship problems? And we're like, I don't even know where to begin. Do we seek counseling? Is it too late? Have we gone too far? Is it over for us? Or maybe your career, or maybe just life in general for you. You've got these problems, and you know something's wrong, but you don't know how to solve the problem. How do you solve a problem like that? Well, most people, they go look for information. And I'm going to tell you today that information is overwhelming. Yeah. Listen, ugh, you, have you ever been, gentlemen, 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 has your wife ever sent you to the grocery store to buy something very simple, like ranch dressing, How can you mess up ranch dressing? But then you walk to the dressing aisle, and how many versions of ranch dressing are there? Three million. There are three million versions of ranch dressing just at Aldi's, right? It's just like, it's amazing. And so you're like, uh, humana, humana, which one? Uh, Should I go with it? Is she a great value? Is she thrifty? Or is she like Paul Newman? Did she like Paul Newman movies? Maybe his dressing. Like, this is what's going on. Uh, What is going on there? It's information overload. And the information hits you so much, you spend way too much time trying to figure out the ranch dressing. And you're late for dinner. And she's like, where were you? And I was like, I was getting the ranch dressing. And you're like, you have PTSD over the ranch dressing. Because the information was just overwhelming. Studies show, scientific studies show, that more information doesn't necessarily help people make better decisions. They've actually found that the more information you have, the less decisive you are. Don't believe me? Well, every year you say, I'm going to lose weight, and then you go to Google. And you Google this, you say, weight loss plan. This is simple, right? Weight loss plan. Sounds really simple, right? How many, shake your head, you know that it's not simple. It is really complex because you go to, you go to Facebook and it, uh, you go to Google and it's like, you are on your phone scrolling for years. And you never reach the end because there is constantly another blog article. And do they all agree? Oh my God, Lord forbid you actually read those things. 
Because that's like, you need to use this supplement, and you go to the next one, is whatever you do, do not use this supplement. Yeah. It'll kill you, and it's a scam. And it's like, I don't know what to do. What it is, is, what is it? And so you know what you end up doing? You don't start a weight loss plan. Yeah. All the information has not helped you make a better decision. It just made you more indecisive. More information makes you less likely to make better decisions because information is overwhelming. Most people try to solve their problems with information only to freak out. So there ought to be a, a better solution for these problems than information. So then you go experience. There it is. I want to tell you though, experience is overrated. Somebody say overrated. Overrated. When you think of the word experience, I go flashback to every job interview I ever had. And they go, well, let's look at the experience. And said, so, you don't have much experience in this area. And I, yes, that's absolutely true. And I would, if you hired me, I would instantly start having that experience, right? I, I'm looking to gain, you know, in fact, that's why I'm uh, trying to get in this field. I'm trying to get said experience in my life and only you are stopping me from it, right? But they're saying, no, it, we're looking for someone with experience. Can I tell you, experience is overrated and you know this because you have worked with people that had a lot of experience and they came in and the boss goes, this person has a lot of experience, and then they come in and they are the worst. They are the worst. You know what they come in with all that experience? Bad habits. Wrong thinking. Bad culture. A chip on their shoulder. Right? They come in with that. That is what experience brings you. I've got a great quote by Oscar Wilde. It is this. Experience is the hardest kind of teacher. It gives you the test first and the lesson afterward. That's what experience does. It says, here is the test. After you fail miserably at this, you might get a lesson out of it. Those are the words of Oscar Wilde. I want to tell you that there, there should be, look, there's the, there's the quote. There, it does exist. All right. There should be a better way to solve our problems than information that overwhelms us and experience that is overrated. So let's jump right to it. What is our way to solve these problems that you don't know how to solve? Here they are. Here's the problem solver. It is guidance. Somebody say guidance is a problem solver. Not just info, not just experience, but a person with wisdom. A person with wisdom. So I gave you the, the Oscar Wilde clip. One more time, put that quote up there. So we got this quote, but I've got a quote from a friend that has a lot of wisdom. He's a pastor named David Fuller, and he always adds this to that quote. He says these words. He says, wisdom gives you the lesson before you face the test. Wisdom gets you ready for the test. In fact, wisdom is so good that sometimes you're able to sidestep some of those tests and never have to face them. You fix problems before they even start. Because of wisdom. Wisdom. So we need people with wisdom. And there's a, there's a phrase that comes in your Bible all over the place, especially in Proverbs, and it is to seek wise counsel, wise people in your life. Here's one such verse. It says Proverbs eleven fourteen. For lack of guidance, a nation falls, but victory is won through many advisors. There's a life verse for you. You need guidance in your life. Without guidance, entire nations fall, but victory is won through many advisors. We need a guide who has climbed our mountain before. I've got a picture up here we're going to throw up on the screen. I want to know, uh, can you name these people? That's not a picture. Those are names. So can you name those names? We're, we're working things out, tech team. we got it. Can you name the first person that reached the summit of Mount Everest? It's Edmund Hillary, but it's not just Edmund Hillary. Edmund Hillary is the one we mention always, but he had a guide with him. And his name is Tenzing Norgay. Can you say Tenzing Norgay? 
Hillary had been trying for about two years to climb the world's tallest mountain, Mount Everest. No one had ever successfully done it. He had been trying for about two years. And when he set out on that day to climb that mountain, he didn't find somebody who had never tried it before. He found somebody who had tried to do it for 20 years. Tenzing Norgay, 20 years prior, had taken his first expedition up the mountain of Mount Everest. And it's because he found somebody who learned the wisdom of that mountain that he was able to go up that mountain also. Now, Ten Tenzing Norgay, had he had reached the summit of Mount Everest before? No. He had a lot of failure, but guess what? He learned a lot of wisdom. He learned, here's, here's the mistakes we made in the past, and there is a wisdom that we can go. We, I, we, we need to go this way. We need to plan for this. And it's because of Tenzing Norgay that you know the name Edmund Hillary. Guidance is a problem solver. You got, are you trying to climb a mountain? Why not find somebody who's tried to climb it and climb it together? So what is your problem? What's your problem? Just think about that. What is it? It could be a lot of things. It could be multiple things. I get it. I've got multiple problems all at once. I get it. I, I live there. You are not alone. If you are problem free, we probably can't get along. I've got loads of problems and everybody said amen. <laughs> but what if, what if there was a guide for you? And what if they were in this room right now? What if the guide you need to climb your mountain is in the room right now? And I think that's how God works. God doesn't just give you the, the vision or the, the goal and the problem is in front of you and you're like, now what? He also has put a guide around you and usually we're just not looking for those people. I want to ask you, what if your solution revealed the importance of others? What if the problem you're going through and coming to the solution realized, helped you realize, I needed another person to overcome my problem? We said earlier in this series that God's word constantly gives us one another's in scriptures. One another's that we need one another's. We need to pray with one another. We need to rejoice with. We need to fellowship with. We need to serve with. Over and over, the Bible tells us that we need one another, all right? But somehow when we have problems, we don't want to tell one another. And that's a problem. That's a problem in itself. God's word says that we need one another. One more time, say one another. Proverbs 27 and 17, well-known verse, it says, As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens iron another. You have that picture of iron sharpening another piece of iron. And that's like a person being a guide to someone else and them helping each other in their struggle. Your edge requires a one another. You, do, are you living on an edge? Do you have an edge in your life? If you don't, then God's probably calling you to someone sitting near you. What if tonight the answer to your problem was not a miracle, an angel. God does miracle angel stuff. But what if his problem answer for you was somebody sitting next to you that knows what you're going through and has a heart to help and has wisdom that they've earned through a relationship with God or through their own struggles? What if that's for you? You know what you should do to get that? You should immediately sign up for connect groups. You should immediately sign up for one of our groups where we sit around and we talk and somebody opens up and they says, I've really got this problem. This happens in every connect group. I'll tell you what happens in every connect group right here. Here it is. I've got this problem with that. And somebody says, I know exactly what's that, what that is like. I'm going to be praying for you because I know how rough that is. And then they go, oh yeah, can you tell me what you did? And they said, well, here's what I did. And I'm so thankful I found God during that time. And they, they, that's every connect group I've ever been to. That happens. And there's pizza usually, and that's good too. But, but connect groups, what is connect groups about? Connect groups is about a one another experience where we 
help one another. We're iron sharpening iron. We're finding guides in our life. Can I tell you, I need guides in my life. Can I tell you, I don't just have guides outside of the church. I've got guides in this church. I've got people I call, I pick up on the phone and I know them and I really call them and I talk through things with them. But there's people in this very room, you are guides for me. And I'm thankful for you. Everybody say connect groups. That's why we push connect groups so much. That's why you're going to hear about it all the time. It's what's good for you, a connect group, I guarantee you. And also prayer. Prayer is a place where you can find a guide. Prayer is a place where you say, I've got this issue. And somebody says, well, I've got a novel idea. Why don't you and me talk to God about it? And that is prayer. And that is a guiding moment. That is a place, a transformational moment can happen. We've got prayer that happens every time we gather together. When we're at a connect group, we pray. When we're at church, we pray. And we're going to pray before we leave tonight. We've got a first Thursday worship and prayer meeting that meets here this Thursday. Come gather. That's a part of your guidance. It solves problems. Anybody a witness that prayer solves problems? Yeah. Amen. And then there's something else I've got to tell you about. I'm really excited about. There's also books of wisdom. Do y'all know about books of wisdom? I mean beyond the Bible. The Bible's full of books of wisdom. In fact, there's an entire book that's called the book of wisdom. It's Proverbs, right? But there's other books of wisdom that you can look at. And you can go find them at your public library or a Barnes & Noble. Or if you're like me, I love me some half price books. Yeah, clearance section. I love it. But there are books of wisdom. And you know what it is? It's like somebody else wrote down ideas and thoughts and fears and expressions of how they answered it. And they put it in a book and you can like, it's almost like you know them. And it's like they guide you in it. And there's all these books up here. I went to Half Price Books like two weeks ago. And I was like, I was just like, I'm going to find me some books here for the church. These books are being given away today. Every one of them is for you. I've got several things here. Anybody have trouble with money? You don't have to raise your hand. But I've got a book here by Dave Ramsey. It's called The Total Money Makeover. That book saved my marriage. This book helped my life. Not even a joke. This book was a godsend in my life. I've got a book version. I've also got his Financial Peace University DVD set. You come up here at the end of church if you want it. It's yours. I've got a book right here for teens. It's called The Seven uh, Habits of Highly Effective Teens. You want to get some uh, principles and some disciplines in your life. That's a book for you right there. We've got uh, Drive. Are you, you have trouble with motivation? This book is one of the best books uh, written right now about it. We've got uh, John C. Maxwell. You want to become a better leader? He's got 21 Irrefutable Laws. That's such a good book. You could just read that book anytime. Just jump to any chapter and you go, wow, that's the exact chapter I needed because every chapter is that good. So good. Um, I've got the five love languages by, by Chapman. That, that's great. You want some relationship stuff? You want some relationship issues? My gosh, that is some good stuff. This, these are books of wisdom. If you've got a problem, go read a book. Right? That is not an unspiritual thing to say. Can we say that? Sometimes your answer is in a book. Go study. Go search it out. Before today's over, we're going to come to this place and pray together. I've also got this book. This has become one of my little favorite books. Somebody told me about this a long time ago, and I should have listened. She tried to guide me in it. But this book is called Strength Finders 2.0. At the back of this book, there's a little test that will tell you what your top five uh, strengths are. And then you can find your strengths in this book, and it'll tell you... This is where your strengths are really suited to be used. And this is maybe how people will misunderstand you. So if you're ever leading a team, this is like a book to buy. Because you need to understand what their strengths are. You need to understand what your strengths are. And you need to maybe give it to them. And so let's compare notes so we understand each other better. Hey, I had breakfast with this guy, Mr. Rich, right here. Wow. That book's yours. Excellent, man. Use it. We got to talk later, okay? More breakfast next time. All right. Excellent, guys. Hey, books of wisdom. I'm telling you, I love the Bible and there are books of wisdom in it. 
But you can look outside of the Bible to find wisdom. And that's not a bad thing too. And what you'll end up finding is a lot of the wisdom in these books originates from God's word. The principles found in God's words. I also want to tell you very quickly, and I'm, I'm going to now, we're descending in our flight. We'll be ending in a little bit. But I want to tell you that uh, there is one thing necessary to solve any problem. Do I have your attention yet? Yeah. There is one thing necessary. You've got to have this one thing if you're ever going to solve a problem. If you're lacking this one thing, you will never solve a problem. All right? Here's the thing. It's observation. Is that a surprising thing to say? Maybe that's kind of surprising. Observation is what I want to talk about the rest of our time together today. Science actually backs up this idea that, that observation is a must, an essential. Uh, there is something called the observer effect, and I'm not smart enough to even understand this, but thankfully I've got a good guide friend named Marshall, and he explained it to me, so I'm going to give you his explanation. Here's the definition of it. Observer effect is the phenomenon in which the act of observe observation alters the behavior of the particles being observed. What does that mean? That means that just by observing something, it changes the thing. You follow, follow me? Here's some simple examples that you can understand. W has anybody ever checked their tire pressure? How'd you check your tire pressure? You put that thing on and it goes, right? The moment you checked your tire pressure, you just changed your tire pressure. By observing your tire pressure, you actually changed it. Or there is observing nature, and we've got those nature videos, right? And they're like, wow, we got a croc here. Look right here. We got this crocodile, and you know, those kind of things. You know how they get those shots? They put a camera in the water, and sometimes it looks like a crocodile, but by just by putting a foreign body in that environment, it actually, in some way, will change the environment just by observing the environment. And then, this is the one that Marshall told me about. Marshall says that they found out, scientific big brain people found out that observing electrons actually changes the behavior of the electrons. Electrons, as something as small as electrons, just by looking at them. They do something differently if you don't look at them. And science found a way to prove that. What does all this mean? Here's what it means. Learn this. In order to change, simply observe. In order to change, simply observe. If in your heart right now you're like, gosh, there is something I've been meaning to change in my life. And you're like, I don't know how to change it. This is your answer today. You need to observe it. And I've got something else for you today. I've got a few copies of this right here. We'll get through that right. What are these? These are notebooks and they're completely empty. There's just empty pages on these. They're for you. If you want them, just come up and grab. You know what, what's so great about this? You write down observations in it and it changes your life. You want to lose weight? Start observing your calorie intake and write it down. Write down your nutrients. Write down what you're eating. And you will lose weight. Want to change your financial situation? Start writing down your spending habits and observe it. Make a budget in this and then start living by it and observe it. Right? Want to change your relationships? Write down some things and observe them. Hey, this is how I felt and now you're journaling your feelings and you're asking yourself really tough questions of why did I feel that way and why did I respond that way to someone I love and why did I say those things I what, what are you doing you're observing simply by observing you will change how about in a spiritual way how about you write down what you're reading in the word of God how about you're writing down what you're praying about and how God has answered and journal those things and observe those things write down something like this God I want to see you fill in the blank and then pray about it for 30 days and come back and observe and see what God has done for you. Right. Observation changes things. Somebody said, it's science. I'm blinding you with science today. 
these are good things to do. These books are for you today before we, before we end. I've got one more thing to say. But what happens, Pastor, when I have a problem too big? And you're going to have a problem too big? A problem too big for a counselor to answer. A problem too big for medicine to answer. A problem too big for a book to answer. Even the Bible. Let's get real. Sometimes you look at the Bible and go, I don't know if I got an answer out of that. I, I, read, I read that whole Bible and I'm not sure what, what came out of that. That's all right. That's all right. You are not alone. There are times when the problem is too big for your pastor. There, there are questions you can ask your pastor and your pastor will go, I don't know. Me neither. I'm not sure. Yeah, you don't have to work, work, reach too far to have those questions. So what do we do? I want to tell you, and I want to end with this. I want to tell you that Jesus is a guide. Somebody say, Jesus is a guide. Uh, in week one, I told you Jesus is a healer for all those healing problems you can't solve. And he's a rescuer for all the rescuer problems you can't solve. I'm telling you that Jesus is the guide when nobody else knows what to do. When everybody shrugs and says, I'm, I don't know. Jesus says, follow me. He walked up to some fishermen who had no hope for their life. They were just some Jews living in an outcast society that was overrun by Romans and they had no hope for the future. And Jesus walks up to him and says, follow me. Let's go up the mountain. Let's go together. That's Jesus. How about this? What's your favorite psalm real quick? Somebody tell me your favorite psalm. It's probably psalm. 23 how does it start the lord is my shepherd i shall not want yeah how about this one he leads me what is it he leads me beside the still waters he leads me in paths of righteousness surely goodness mercy will follow me all the days of my life why because i'm following the right guide oh that whole chapter is about Jesus, the Lord, being your guide. Jesus is a God who says, follow me. He says it today to you. Follow me and I'll show you how to live. Follow me, I'll show you how to love. I'll show you how to forgive. I'll show you how to serve others. I'll show you how to be the husband you want to be. How to be the wife you want to be. How to be the parent you want to be. How to be the son or the daughter you want to be. How to be the pastor you want to be. How to be the worshiper you want to be. How to be the worker that you want, that you want to be. Whatever it is you want to be, Jesus says, Oh, I can show you how to do that. Follow me. That's our Jesus. Is there a witness in this house that God has been that kind of guide for you? He's been that kind of guide for me. I'm going to ask our, our worship team to come. I just, I just feel like being uh, a little... Tri no, wait, one second. I've got, a, I've got this story I'm supposed to tell. Here it is. We were buying a house. We were buying a house. We were so thankful we owned a house. God helped us. We had a condo right? But we, our family was growing, and so we're like, well, let's find a house, and we found a house in Garland, and so what we were going to do is we were going to buy this house and sell the condo. It seemed to make the most sense because it was the easiest thing to do. We didn't want to have two mortgages. We didn't want to have to deal with being a landlord and buying a house. So we didn't want to do, so we said, well, fine, we'll just do that. And I'm telling you, I know exactly where I was when this happened. I was on where Avenue K turns into Plano Road right there as it enters Richardson. And I was sitting at a red light. And the rest of this story basically happens at that red light. God does a lot in just a few moments. I'm sitting at that red light and I feel I feel like God speak to me. It's not an audible voice. I, I, if God speaks an audible voice, that's really cool. I've never heard that. But God spoke like right to my heart. And I was just minding my own business, sitting at the red light. And God said, it was like this. It, I promise you, it happened just like this. He's like, so, uh, God started with a so, uh, I swear he did. He's like, so, uh, you're not going to ask me about selling the condo? You're just going to, you're just going to do that on your own? And I was like, I'm, I was like, that hit me like right in the heart. And I was like, 
Oh, I'm really sorry about that, God. I'm sorry. Oh, whoa, whoa, you're right. He's right. You got me. I'm like, I was totally, we were, that's exactly what we were doing. We were going to make what we thought was the best decision without seeking your guidance. And so I said, I'm sorry. Forgive me for that. Is it okay that we sell it? Because we're kind of doing it. And the Lord said, I, right to my heart, I had this assurance. I knew it. It said, he said, you shouldn't sell it right now. And then I was like, okay, we're not going to sell it. Next question, how do I tell my wife? Really, that's how this works. And the light's still red, all right? God did all this like really quick. And so I, uh, I felt the Lord then remind me of a story of a time Sarah told me about her grandfather owned houses in Richardson, where we were, where our condo was, and that he had regretted selling them rather than keeping them. And I'm like, well, that's it. And so I went to Sarah and I said, okay, you know where Avenue K turns into Plano Road? <laughs> God spoke to me there and he said, hey, we should ask him before we do things. We should ask him before we do things. Is he the Lord of our life or not? Whose life is it? Oh, well, listen, had we just not asked him and sold it, he would have still loved us, but I'm telling you, we would have missed out on this blessing that's about to happen in this story. So Sarah, being the wonderful spiritual lady that she is, says, God told you that? Let's do it. We're going to figure it out. And we figured that out. All right, here's the thing. Now, numbers. Let's talk numbers. I bought that house for 66000 in 2007. We're trying to sell that in about 2014, 2014. So we were about to sell that condo for 80000 That's what we could get for it. And I was like, woo-hoo, we made a profit of $14,000 on this condo. But God says, don't do it. And so we don't. Three months later, the going rate for that condo, something happened. <laughs> Something happened that only God could have foreseen because we are not real estate geniuses. That value of that condo went from 80000 to 110000 in three months. You know what we did then? God, is it okay? Do you want us to sell this now? We were like, thank you, God, that you spoke to us. Thank you, God, that you did point out that I was living my life like I was the ruler of my life. Thank you for red light visits, Lord. Thank you, God. I want your guidance. And so now, three months later, I still want your guidance. And we didn't feel like God wanted us to. I, I didn't feel like this heart thing, but I didn't feel like this release to do it. I didn't feel the peace to do it. So we didn't do it. So you know what? We sold that house around 20... 2019 for $180,000. We asked the Lord and we felt like that was the time. And here's what I want to tell you. I've wanted to tell you this all week. Listen, we're used to saying that, that talking to God is really good for like spiritual butterfly feelings, like, you know, the, the feelings, the, the goosebumps and your emotional things, and you'll feel really better. Let me tell you, talking to God is valuable for everyday life. It is, it is for, for things like bank accounts. Is God worth listening to for 30000 Oh, you bet. Is God worth listening to for an extra 100000 Oh, yeah, you bet. Can I tell you, listening to God is worth more than any amount you can put on it God is that good of a guide and I want to tell you for the rest of your life I want you to ask God before you do things I'm not asking telling you to be afraid to do things I'm going to ask you to invite God to guide you as you climb up the mountain Jesus, can you get me to the summit? God, can you get me to a happy life? God, can you get me to be a really good disciple of you that makes disciples? God, could you bring me to that place? He wants to do that. Far too often, we don't ask. The Bible says very clearly, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask. Because God gives it liberally. Let's bring our musicians up. I've got a call to action for you today. 
You can clap for that. God's that good. Yeah, he is. Hey, I want to, as they're coming, I just, I want to tell you the reason we're in Plano right now is because of the wisdom God gave us in 2014. We couldn't afford a house in Plano right now at all because the houses are crazy. But God got us in in 2019 and when we sold that condo for that extra $100,000, we were able to afford the house that we're in. And look where we are now. God, we're here today because God guided us to this moment. Would everybody stand with me? I'm going to ask us to have a time of prayer. They're going to sing in just a moment. But I want to give you some calls to action over the next few moments of these songs. I want you to worship, feel God's presence. But I want you to come up and grab a notebook. We got these notebooks here. Write your observations. Write them. Write them. There's some books right here. I'll just... Sarah, could you just kind of throw those books in? If you want a book, you come up. I only ask two things observe it don't just grab a book really observe it and number two let me pray with you that god would give you the guidance from that book is deal is that cool is that worth it all right and then two more things look for others pray over the next few moments god show me someone else that can help guide me and they could be in the room and if god puts it on your heart that they're in the room go to them and say hey can we have coffee sometime? If someone comes up to you and says, can we have coffee sometime? Your answer is yes, okay? And if you don't have the money, I will buy you that coffee so you can go sit with them because God's putting it in their heart for you to guide them. And then last, last, we got notebooks, we got books, we got others, and then we have Jesus. For you in this place that you are facing something that's a bigger problem than you are able to face, I want to tell you right now to talk to Jesus pray and I would be willing to pray with you and I know that he is the guide that you need Father why don't you all come in this place as I pray for our online friends Father in Jesus name I pray for all online friends that you would touch every one of their hearts that you'd minister to them God that you'd meet them right where they are Lord that you'd give them that guidance that they need Lord that they wouldn't live life all by themselves that they'd find other wise people in their life lord help them to start observing some things in their life and bring change in their life god help them god to reach out to you and find you god you are the best guide that we could ever ask for father in jesus name we pray all of this in the name of jesus come on church let's take a few moments and reach out to the lord for more information about redemption look us up online at redemption-church.com We want to hear from you, so be sure to connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, or even our anonymous question text line at 214-856-0550.